Welcome to the Super Conscious Success Podcast, where Jen and her Super Conscious Success family co-hosts bring you valuable content each and every week on topics relating to manifestation, spirituality, and most of all, using your super conscious to manifest success in all areas of your life. Now on to today's episode. Hey there, Super Conscious Success fam. Welcome to another episode of my co-host's segment, Peace and Prosperity, with my amazing friend and executive coach, Christopher Salem. Our intention with this segment is to help entrepreneurs and business owners who are all struggling to maintain harmony in their lives, have successful relationships, health, and of course, wealth. Through our nine anchor transformational process, we will help you create this harmony by optimizing all nine anchors. In this segment, we interview executive coaches, intuitive business leaders, and successful business people in an effort to give you insight and tips on how you too may be able to create the harmony in your lives that you're looking for. So today we've brought you an incredible guest that is going to bring some serious insight into your life and your business. Now, our guest today is an organizational leader, community builder, and education innovator, and he's absolutely obsessed with trust and intuition as I am too. His number one goal is to empower everybody that he meets to follow their heart so that they can live a more connected, meaningful life. David Richards founded the Growth Public School, which is a kindergarten to eight charter school in Sacramento, which proves that learner and heart-centered schools are the way of the future. He is the father to two children that he absolutely adores and a loving wife. In today's episode, we're going to talk about your inner guidance system when it comes to leadership. So I'm so excited to get started. Chris is not yet here. He's um He had something else on. Hopefully he'll, he'll pop in in the meantime, but otherwise, we're going to have a great interview. Hey, David, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for having me. I'm really honored to be here. Oh, it's thank you. So honor much. and privilege. Yeah, thank you so much for being here. I know you've kind of gone through your own share of, of, of COVID and stuff going on. So <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> I'm glad that you're back on the mend and you're able to get back to what you love um, with your school and all the other amazing projects that you've got going on. So um, thanks for being here. Now, before we get started, can you tell us how you kind of came to be interested in starting your own charter school and kind of what your story is um, in regards to this? Yeah, well, I had worked in education since I first graduated from college, and I was really excited about helping people, right, as a mm -hmm. teacher and empath. Now I help all different ages, but at that time, I really thought, I want to work with kids, and I was so excited. And I went into a traditional public school that's kind of run like a government entity, right? Mm -hmm. And after about three months, I just felt like I couldn't do it. I really couldn't. I just felt like it was so broken and the kids were not first and it was all about the adults and there were just so many yeah. problems. So I ran as fast as I could away from that. And I ended up getting a really prestigious job two blocks from the White House in Washington, D.C., and I was a corporate banker and I worked at a bank that every single president of the United States has had an account at. And wow. it was like one of those banks, you know, and, mm -hmm. um, and when I turned 30, I really felt like this is not my calling yeah. to be a corporate banker, even though the money was great. And, the, you know, uh, working in a bank where you work nine to five is the best. It wasn't like investment banking. It was like yeah. nine to five. <laughs> Everyone's gone <laughs> at 501. So I told everyone that I was going to quit my job to go work in a high school. Mm -hmm. And every single person there thought I was literally insane. And it really was an intuitive calling. It, it was, I left work one day and I went into a Borders bookstore. And remember when they used to have those on every yeah. corner? Yeah, <laughs> back, back in the day when they actually had bookstores. <laughs> yeah, right? We've got one in Perth left. Exactly. Now it'd be like I was scrolling on Amazon. But yeah, so I went into the bookstore and I just happened to land in the self-help section or whatever. And it was all very guided. And at that point I didn't have the language, but I knew something was going on. And I found Martha Beck's book called Finding Your Own North Star. Okay. And I sat down and I read the whole entire book cover to cover, like until they kicked me out of the place at 10 p.m. <laughs> and I literally just said, I'm going to be a teacher. I'm going to work with disenfranchised youth. I'm going to help people that had difficult children, a childhood like I did. And I'm going to try and make a difference in their lives. And so I took the leap and it was an intuitive leap of faith. And like I said, my family, I was the first one in my family to go to college. I was supposed to be the one that was going to help everybody financially. And I'm like, uh -huh. hey, I'm going, to, I'm going to go to teach. And they're like, how much does a teacher make? And I said, well, I'm going in the inner city. So I'll be starting at 37,000. They're like, <laughs> oh, what? You've got... your <laughs> exactly. 
<laughs> You've gone from like, banker salary to this? <laughs> and they're like, you, so I said, I'm going to Stanford and they like that part. And then they're like, but your, your Stanford degree actually is more expensive than you know, your 10, first 10 years of salary as a teacher. But it was an intuitive calling. And that's why I'm yeah. really big now on really telling people, like you said, obsessed. I'm obsessed with helping people trust themselves, trust that yeah. inner guidance system. Yeah. Because the higher intelligence is guiding you. And I would have been miserable if mm -hmm. I had stayed at that bank. And I remember sitting there at the age of 29. And, you know, you have these, these um, moments in your life at 30, 40, whatever, 50, 60, but these decade moments. But I remember sitting there and asking everybody, why do you work at this bank? Mm -hmm. And 90% of the people answered it this way. Well, I was a sociology major. I was an economics major. And then I just landed here and I never left. Uh, Do you enjoy yeah. working here? Not really, but I love the weekends and Friday nights. And I'm yeah, like, that's, that's not, sad. <laughs> that's not what I strive to be, you know, in this blip of a radar we have on, in life. I don't strive to be somebody who's excited about Friday nights and just getting through the day. So I just really took the leap there. And then from there, I ended up in the inner city. I worked in Oakland Public Schools, which is, you know, a very dysfunctional school system. Mm -hmm. And I, I was going to say by luck, but really it wasn't by luck because everything was guided. I found a charter school organization that ended up opening 10 schools in 10 years and received um, a massive donation from Mark Zuckerberg and other philanthropists. Wow. That was really about how do we teach kids to be self-directed? So how do we take these principles of you know, trusting the children, trusting, letting them trust themselves, allowing them to guide their lives instead of the education yeah. system, which is really like, you know, the whole, the whole basis of the traditional education system is that kids are empty vessels yeah. and it's based on the way corporate America is built. Yeah. You're an empty vessel. We're going to control you and we're going to pour information into you and you're going to, you know. So. And I think, it's, and I think Australia is very much the same. It, it's a real broken system. We don't, we yeah. don't have, you know, we learn our maths and our science and our social studies and all this sort of stuff, which is obviously stuff that kids just do, don't, not interested in learning. Um, <laughs> and are probably never going to use it unless you're going to become a scientist hey. or an architect or whatever it is. But, and I think that there's so much that's missing. And yes. the, the ability to teach children how to how to listen to their own intuition, the ability to yes. teach children how to alter their mindsets yes. and to have trust. And and I think I think that's what I love so much about the charter school. So how is a charter school different uh, to the to the normal public school? Yeah. So we like to call them public charter schools because people think they're, you know, privately funded, but they're actually funded through the state and the federal government in the United States. I, I'm sure it's similar in other countries, yeah. but basically it's a publicly funded school and you have to follow the regulations of the public school system for the most part, but you're able to have your own charter or your yes. own way of doing it. And so I found this charter school that showed me that, you know, you could really do creative things with kids as yeah. long as you follow the bureaucratic regulations. And yeah. so you get kind of creative. And you're able to fund this school, which means you can accept any child. So there's not any kind of economic barriers. Okay. And like I said, I wanted to work with kids that like me grew up poor. I didn't want to work with kids that could only afford you know, expensive private schools for me yeah. personally. So yeah. the charter school is a perfect mix because I could bring in the high quality kind of private school model, but in an accessible economic way for every family. So that's the school that I opened here in Sacramento. And it's, it's extremely diverse economically, racially, ethnically. And um, we're in a pocket of Sacramento that's kind of forgotten. Yeah. And we brought a school in there. And our whole vision is that we're going to turn the community around with love and energy and just really like let, like trusting the kids. So yeah. to the point, if everybody went through a school system where you were trusted and you were told that you could choose your path and trust your intuition and that you have a higher self that could guide you, can yeah. you imagine the world that oh, we would live in? Wouldn't, wouldn't we be in a such better world? There would be, there would be a, probably a lot less anxiety in kids. There would be a lot yes. less depression in kids. It would yes. be, they would be able to tap into their emotions because I think this is something that the schools tend to knock out of you. The moment a kid starts yes, getting are. emotional, um, all of a sudden it's like, stop crying or stop doing yes. this. Or, yes. And it's like, you're, you're telling them from such a young age that it's wrong for yeah. them to feel their emotions. Yeah. And, and that is, that can be damaging to a child. And I know that with, you just mentioned that you came from a household that was poor. Yeah. And so you've been through the experiences. Now, what was your school yeah. experience like? You know, I went to 17 schools between kindergarten oh, wow. and high school. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and it was to my parents' credit. I, I mainly grew up with my, with my mother, but, but 
to my parents' credit, they did find ways to get me in the better schools. Yeah. Like they would have the apartment that was right on the, the side of the border that allowed you to go into the nice school. So yeah. I did grow up with good, a good education, but I always felt very un, I didn't, I felt like I didn't fit in. Yeah. Because it was more affluent kids and I was always like the poor kid or whatever. So I did yeah. get the good education, but socially I was always, and then we were always moving. So they were really good at putting me in really great school. So I knew growing up what a great school was like. Yeah. You know, and, and that's, like, and that's a good thing is important. that it has actually, it has actually made you see what the, what the good schools are, what you can incorporate into yes. your school. I know myself, I'm a lot like you. Um, yeah. My family struggled as well. I remember, I remember the days when the power was turned off um, oh, yeah. because the power bill wasn't paid my dad oh, yeah. got hepatitis um mm. and he was in hospital for three months and had no income coming in except yeah. for you know obviously social security or whatever it was and right. so I remember like the candles I mean they always tried to make it as good for us as they could Absolutely. you know by by playing board games by candlelight and trying to minimize the effect it had but we traveled a lot as well and yeah. so I changed schools from time like quite frequently what yeah. impact do you think because I know with myself the impact of shifting schools frequently you're changing your friend circle a lot yeah. did you yeah. find that like it was like I you found that friends? You know, absolutely and you know what I was just telling my kids about because we actually have committed to keeping them in the same school yeah. then I was scratching my head and I'm like wait then I'm telling my kids I'm like honestly I'm the most adaptable person on the planet yeah because that's you a can good drop thing me about into, it yeah you can drop me into any social situation or work situation and I just chameleon chameleon I'll just be like okay I'm yeah, good and I, I'm so, sorry, I mean yeah. it's great as an entrepreneur right because totally in my opinion adaptability and like going with the flow of life as an yeah. entrepreneur it's it's imperative right and so as a kid I was like oh I'm used to chaos I'm used to moving I'm used mm -hmm. to new situations so I actually think that's why I don't do well we were talking before you started recording you know I don't do well with like I have about two years in me before I switch projects or like <laughs> yeah. careers because I'm so used to everything changing. So but that's what's so great about being an entrepreneur is that you can change yeah. it up as much as you like yes. and yes. you can, you can change your course or you can add something great. We'll add something else to our, yeah. to our repertoire yeah. of projects. Yes. And yes. that's what's so great about being an entrepreneur and having that control within yourself yes. to be able to go, okay, it's time for me to go outside of my comfort zone once more. Yes. And yes. push myself to to do something that I didn't think that I'd be able to do. Absolutely. And that's what's so amazing in comparison to a lot of nine to five jobs where we're doing the same thing every day, day after day. And I'm a lot like you. I think adaptability, when you're having to shift schools so much or you know, even just the whole thing of you know having to pack up your house all the time and having to shift to another place, Yes. It teaches you how how to be adaptable. I mean, my husband, he lived in the same house his entire life. He went to the same school yeah. his entire life. And yeah. so us shifting was a big thing for him. Whereas yeah. me, it was just like, oh, here we go. You know, it's, 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 yeah. <laughs> it's just normal. <laughs> so, yes, yeah, so I, I, get, I get what you mean. So it's kind of like that tug of war, isn't it? It's like, do we keep them in the same school for right. thing or do we allow like start to bring that adaptability into them as well. Absolutely. Well, what I try and, te try and teach them is the same way, same way I live my life, which is really following your intuition. Yeah. And really, and what I like to say is that, you know, you like me leaving that bank was literally, mm -hmm. I have stories like that. When I was 40, I left this organization that I was telling you about that got all this money from the philanthropist and I was in, in, a succession, in line to succeed the CEO. Yeah. And, um, and I left and I left to go start my own school from nothing. And yeah. so that was when I turned 40. So both times people thought everybody, you know, the collective other, as Mark Babette calls it, thought I was crazy. Yeah. And what I knew is like deep down inside, I knew the truth and I mm -hmm. knew what intuition was telling me what to do. Now it takes a little while to discern, right? Yes. Like I didn't quit my executive job like the next day because I had to pay the mortgage. Yeah. And I kind sure. of like was waiting and I'm like, okay, wait, there's something that keeps coming. And, you know, intuition is very persistent. They just kept coming in different ways. And then the universe gives you the signs and the symbols. And you're like, I have to pay attention. And you start paying attention. They're everywhere. And then I just was like, I'm going to do it. And of course, when I quit my, you know, when I left that job at 30 and within like five years, I was already making more money than I was making at the bank. Right. Yeah. Because it was the right path. And when I left my other job, my prestigious job at 40, you know, I got these donations like really quickly. And, and it was the entrepreneurial thing where like, 
I had no money and then it was December 31st and then the funder called me on December 30th. So it's like the universe has your back. And it you totally has your back. Yeah. And intuition and, will guide you. Yeah. So. And before we, I mean, we're going to delve into your intuition because I think it is so important. And, you know, superconscious success is all about, is all about your superconscious or your higher self. So, yeah. um, but how about, what is your definition if we're talking about intuition, what's your definition? Hey there, I really hope that you're enjoying this episode and I ask that you subscribe so that you don't miss out on any upcoming episodes that I publish. Let me interrupt the show just for a moment to let you know about something amazing that I have to offer you. Firstly, if you haven't yet signed up for my free Superconscious Success in a Circle, then definitely go ahead and do that now. However, that's not what I'm here to talk to you about today. Today, I want to let you know about an upcoming virtual intensive that's coming up in September of this year. If you've been enjoying the content that Chris and I have been bringing you, then you are going to absolutely love what we have to offer. We've put together the most incredible three-day intensive full of content showing you how you can integrate our nine anchor transformational process to create harmony in your life and manifest the relationships and the finances and the health that you desire. You really can have it all if you know how to harmonize. Plus, I have even better news. If you're a member of our inner circle, then there's a special link in there that will actually give you 50% off the cost of the intensive up until the 31st of August. So what will you receive with this intensive? Now, we knew you were most likely super busy running your business and your life. So we decided that instead of three days of live training, we would be pre-recording content so that you can watch it in your own time throughout the day. And then we would offer a live lunchtime session with myself and Chris and some evening sessions with special guests for the VIP ticket holders. Now to sign up for this, you can head across to universalconsciousnessworkshops.com slash 9ATP intensive or head across to superconscioussuccess.com slash inner circle and get it for 50% off. Now, thanks for listening and let's head on over to the interview. What's your definition of intuition? Yeah, to me, it's like really simple. It's following that whisper. Mm-hmm. Or the feeling it's the feeling or the whisper and however it comes for you and it's it's literally just knowing yeah what that is for you like knowing yourself so well that you're like I know what that is I know exactly what it is I know exactly how it's speaking to me and I think you know for me being a man I'm very much into the feminine kind of knowledge of intuition and knowing the yeah. the, the message but then I really like you know as an entrepreneur I really like to execute Yes. And so I am a little crazy when I get the intuitive message, my wife starts getting nervous. She's like, oh, <laughs> he's going to like, Oh, he's going to, we're all, we're all moving to like, you know, Australia tomorrow, yeah. you know, like for all yeah. we know tomorrow, I'll be like, we're moving to Australia. I talk to Jen and she's saying, really <laughs> I'm kidding. That but, like, that's cool. how- <laughs> You're welcome, David. <laughs> <laughs> but she's always nervous that like the truth is going to come through. And so yeah. to me, intuition is like the truth is right there for you to access. It's a whisper. It's the, you know, that small voice. And it's like, can you connect with it? Can you really hear it? And then can you actually discern and bring it from the unmanifested into the form? Oh, I love that. And the thing is that I know even with myself, I, people are frightened, I think, to pivot. And we've, mm-hmm. you know, maybe we've spent four years at college or four years at university or whatever, and we put all our sweat and our tears into learning whatever we have there. And yeah. so we've built this career and then all of a sudden we get that little whisper in like from our higher yeah. self. And yeah. how do we all of a sudden just give up everything that we've done? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, to because I know I've pivoted a number of times and my oh, husband yeah. just goes, okay. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But but you have to because this is when your intuition calls, it's for a purpose. Because mm-hmm. when, as you just said, when you listen to your intuition. The universe has your back and the universe says, you know what you want, Mm -hmm. but now I'm going to bring it to you. Exactly. And and so, so what part do you think that fear um, of, I suppose it's fear of the unknown really, isn't it? Because you don't really know where it's going to take you. What impact does that have in entrepreneurship? Yeah. I mean, fear is so fascinating and I have, 
done so much work on fear. And it's, for me, it's really comes down to the inner child. And yeah. you know, I said, I had, I told you, we, I grew up without, without money and a lot of poverty and trauma. And it's like, I really sit with fear. I sit down with fear on the bench. Yeah. And I really just sit right next to it and say like, thank you so much for sharing with me what's coming or what could happen. Thank you for your service. Like, thank you so much. And thank you for getting me this far in my life. And thank you for all the trauma where you helped me not, you know, get killed as a child. And I always yeah. think here and I always like sit with it and just send so much love and then say like, okay, I, and then I ask for guidance from yeah. the highest self and fear. And I just say like, fear, what do you, what, what do you want to say? I know you want to be heard. I know you want to be seen, which is a lot like the inner child. What yes. do you want to be? What do you want to say? And what do you want me to hear? And then the fear will say like, I'm really worried if you pivot right now that we're not going to have a house and we're going to die and we're going to be homeless. You know, like we almost were so many it's times. All those child, beliefs, isn't it? Because yeah. we've been brought up and especially if we are brought up in a household which was poor, um, yeah. that we're struggling to to pay the mortgage, then there's always yeah. that fear that what that if fear. we're in that same situation? And yeah. especially like for us that use our intuition, it's like natural for us. And, yes. and it's the only way we can live. We can't live any other yes. way. But so for true. those that are just getting sort of started and yeah. how, how can they discern what their, what their intuition is? Because we know we have an ego and we have our yes. higher self. Yes. How can yes. we discern between whether it's our ego talking? Because, of course, our ego will be saying, don't do that because, you know, exactly. if you do that, you're going <laughs> to. Um, or if it's our higher self and our intuition yeah. talking. How do we do that? You know, I yeah, it's such a great question. I really feel like it's getting to know yourself so well. It's getting to know mm -hmm. your feelings in your body mm -hmm. and also practicing. So yeah. I have a course that I teach called the inner GPS and it's all about, I tell people just practice it a little bit at a time yeah. on what I call like the small stake things, you know, like yeah. maybe I'm supposed to do that or maybe I should call this person or maybe I shouldn't, you know, whatever, just these yeah. small things that are, if, if they don't go right, you'll be okay. So you practice with those and you see where that takes you. And then you practice with the ones you think are intuition, but are actually fear. And yeah. the ones that are actually fear will take you into more suffering. Yes. And so you just, you just observe and you're like, oh, I practice some of these small things. And all of a sudden five great things happen. I thought this was intuition and I followed that. And then like five bad things happen. Well, yeah. then you, you start to get to know the feeling in your body. And so that's why I did this inner GPS course, because so many people ask me like, how do you do this? And, you know, I'm like, well, I'm a teacher, I'm a pragmatist. So I'll break it down for you. And like, a, you know, a, a a recorded course that you can just follow and that's basically what I do I take you from you know what is the basics all the way to the big decisions the small decisions and just following your inner guidance and, and see what happens and it's so much fun so well much that's fun. oh it is so much fun I absolutely love yeah. intuition I love the whole um being able to tap into that higher self I think it is so powerful and I often call them downloads because yes. it's it's kind of like all of a sudden you'll you'll start getting all of these downloads from from your yes. higher self and you know I went through and I I yesterday my high not yesterday day before my higher self just said okay we're getting to work on one of your programs and I outlined an entire 12-week program in like an hour it. and it was yeah, just like that's and, it was, <laughs> and it's amazing um, yeah, that's also as as I was just saying, you know, intuition is so powerful, and it's it's so um, yeah. You know, without it, I don't know what like how I would be able to survive. What about you, David? <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I always think about it as I have always followed my intuition. Yeah. But I didn't realize that I was number one, and the number two because I would follow it. Like when I when I turned thirty, and I just did it. I just knew that I had to do it. But then because I didn't realize what I was doing, I created so much suffering Yeah, I went into yeah. the mind, the mind yes. that was telling mm -hmm. you, why are you doing this? What about this? Yeah, you go side. Fear. Yeah. Yes. And it just worked me into a stupor, right? And so now I know that when something crazy happens or I follow intuition that it's like, okay, it's going to be a little bumpy and it's a little unknown and it's a little scary, but I know it's all going to land just fine. But it's, it's really trying not to create that suffering because it's just, you just create so much, you lose so much energy through that process. Oh, absolutely. And I think that, you know, it does take practice. Like David said, it takes practice to be able to tap into that intuition, to be able to become comfortable enough with yourself that yes. you can start to discern um, between, you know, is this my ego talking um, yes. or is this my higher self? And actually myself and a collaborator of mine, Eleni, we're creating a program called Higher Self Mastery. 
And so this is really about tapping into your higher self and learning how to distinguish between the ego and the higher self's messages. Now, what impact do you think that emotions have? Because we know that in order to be able to tap into our intuition, we have to be in a certain vibration, right? Absolutely. Yeah. I, I, it's, it's feel all the feelings, feel Mm -hmm. all the feelings. And I feel like it, I feel like (laughs) that, I mean, that's the work, right. Is really, and I I do feel like we're in a massive paradigm shift with the world we're in right now. And like something is shifting, something's changing and feeling all the feelings is drastically important. And with the schools that I run, it's all about that. I mean, kids are already doing this. So how do we just make sure they're continuing to do it and not, and not uh, losing their emotion? Yeah, absolutely. Hey, Chris, welcome. Doing, Thanks for joining us. Doing well. Nice sorry about that. I had my group call. Yeah, it that, sounds uh, like it went really oh. well. Late, I'm sorry. Yeah, I've no, it's that okay. We've been, we've been having a really good conversation about his uh, growth public school. And we're, at the moment, we're talking about intuition and that inner knowing, which is, um, which is so much fun. Hey, David. <laughs> Absolutely. So much fun. So, so we were just we were just talking about how uh, intuition, how the intuition and the ego play a part in us, and and how we can differentiate between the two, and you know, and and we we're just talking about emotions, and you know, when we look at the emotional guidance scale to be able to to move up to that to that state that actually allows that intuition to come in, all those messages to come in. Um, I think that it's really important that we stay on the upper end of that scale. But at the same time, we have to, as you said, feel those feelings. And this is what's so great about your growth uh, charter school is that you allow those kids to be able to express those feelings. Yep. Yeah, Yeah, it's everything. It's everything. And kids are are the guides, right? Like they show us, (laughs) they show us how to play with our divine child. It's just like, Absolutely. You just spend time around children, you know, and so <laughs> they already know how to feel all their feelings, but we change that and take it out of them. So all we do at my school is just to ensure that the environment, you know, is created such that they can continue to be the spirited children they already are. Right. We yeah. Don't, rather than have it taken already. out of them. Yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. Exactly. So, so <laughs> let's go into leadership because mm-hmm. I wanted to talk about yeah. this because um, David, like us, Chris, David is an entrepreneur that, um, likes to do lots of different things and he follows I got the crazy bug I have the crazy bug bug. (laughs) um so he has lots of different yeah (laughs) so he has lots of different things going on at once um but what part does intuition have to play when it comes to leadership yeah I mean it's really everything and Mm. I I'm working on a book right now about mindful leadership okay I feel like yeah and I feel like that is exactly what it's into it. It's, it's knowing where you are at every moment, mm-hmm. where you are, are you an ego? Are you an essence? Where's, you know, where you are as a leader, if yeah. you're having a conversation and you notice that things are starting to go south, you know, you're dipping into ego, your vibration is going down and you can have tools to pull yourself back up. And yeah. we know that everyone's a mirror. We know that everyone responds to the energy. So to me, mindful leadership is really about self-awareness and really understanding where you are each moment and all the things you can do to actually make yourself not dip so that yeah. you have a positive environment and it's clear communication it's a lot of the traditional things that you would imagine with leadership but in this new paradigm that we're in it's really about deeply understanding yourself mm-hmm. and how you lead others with a clear vision and you know really knowing where you are and whether you're whether you're in your own inner child wounds or whatever it may be, or if you're actually in, as you would say, Jennifer, your highest, highest self. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that as a successful leader, it's also about being able to instill that in your team too. Because absolutely. like you said, we're mirrors. And yeah. so if we show that higher vibration, if we show them that, you know, you show them the compassion, you show them the understanding, you show them um, how they can tap into their own intuition, we we create better teams. Yeah, absolutely. We create way more successful teams because they're like, wow, I have the power and also giving them a voice. And I think, yes. don't you think that that's really important as a leader to give them a voice to offer suggestions or, um, you know, a part in, in the business? Absolutely. I mean, yeah. it's everything. And I'm trying to remember the book right now. It's driving me crazy, but I'll remember it in a second. <laughs> but there's a book that I love and it talks about, 
teal leadership and it talks about the different phases of organizational leadership yeah how we started yeah. with the command and control like the school district and you know the army and then we kind of evolved to like ben and jerry's which is much more democratic and consensus building and the next version of reinventing organizations thank you i remembered it so yeah. reinventing yeah. organizations it's very dense but they have a nice little illustrated guidebook that's really cool that we use at my school and I, I've shared with a lot of other leaders because I also do leadership coaching and executive coaching. But basically it talks about the next phase of organizational leadership is teal. And it's all about what you were saying. It's about giving people a voice. It's about self-management. Yeah. So there's yeah. um, one of the most successful tomato companies in the world is just down the street from me and they use self-management. And oh. so it's all about not these hierarchical, hierarchical structures, but how do you organize people around what they already are best at and giving them the tools yeah. and the power and the voice to, and it's like, they're, it's so successful when it's done right. And people always say to me, that sounds crazy. Like, how do you create an organization like that? And I'm like, you just, you have different structures and systems. And, so and because an we have to tap right? into everybody's individual, you know, we've all Absolutely. got our own abilities and strengths and talents. So why not Absolutely. bring a team together that is able to help each other to, exactly. to, build, to build the business up? What do you think about this, yeah. Chris? No, I agree. I love what I mean, even though I'm coming in halfway through here, I, I agree with David 100%. I mean, I'm all, if you're going to establish an interdependent work culture or a company, you know, it, it has to lend itself to autonomy, meaning that people have to lead themselves. And mm. the best way to lead themselves is learning from what they observe in the people that are doing that consistently each and every day. They're being the example consistently. Yeah. They're being resourceful and empowering people to do their, you know, to do, learn on their own, to focus on the things that you're good at versus the things you're not. So the, so the companies that really do a good job of putting people in situations that leverage their strengths, offsetting their weaknesses and finding that harmony are going to be the ones that are going to forge ahead and come out ahead. And there are, there yeah. are organizations, handfuls of them out there doing that. And many that are not, unfortunately, yeah. and exactly. you know, it's, you know, they, they, they're in the cover your butt syndrome, you know, of like, hey, I'm not going to put my myself on the line, you know, if something doesn't work. Yes. Those are the organizations that stay stagnant. Yeah. So everything that I heard what David has shared is spot on yeah. to my findings of uh, being in this space. So I agree 100%. Absolutely. And I think that uh, Chris being an executive coach like you too, David, uh, you've both seen businesses where they are stagnant and they just kind of they don't want to go outside of their comfort zone. They're stuck in that. But what if I get in trouble? And what if, you know, someone comes down hard on me? Well, they stay in the same same spot that they've been in for the last 20 years. So yep. our job, um, you know, Chris and I have the Nine Anchor Transformational Process, which is a program that we've created uh, for the corporations to be able to go in and and teach them about leadership and teach them about being able to go outside of that comfort zone, go outside yes. of that box, bring the best out in your team, um, and also bring harmony within within the environment, within your within your life. So I think I think it's really important that maybe managers and leaders start to look at things a little bit different and start to recognize that, you know, what was once a receptionist, and I've spent many years as receptionist over my over my time. The receptionist is is the the front house to the to the business, and so once you start to look at the receptionist as being an important part of of the business, then yep. they start to feel in lift lifted up, and then yep. they start to bring their best, because there's nothing there's nothing worse than than being in a in a company where you're you're dismissed, and yep. um, so I think I think that's really powerful, and I think once you start to to incorporate intuition into it and teach your team how to do that teach your team how to say okay if something doesn't feel right you need to tap into that if yeah. something's feeling a little bit off let me know well, um, yeah an organization is like an organism and yeah it is you know so if you think about the way organizations are run it's there you're trying to command and control everything right as yeah. a leadership team and if you actually just let it flow just like the universe just like nature then you start to see that like, wow, amazing things are happening here. We're not in resistance to what's actually happening. We're seeing the as is, and now we're trusting our people to work together and solve problems. It's really cool. And our, my charter school that I worked with was named as one of the top 10 most innovative companies in the world. And we're not even a company. 
So it's clearly like the values and the culture that you can bring, whether you're a for-profit or a nonprofit. Yeah. You can actually do really amazing things when you bring the innovation principle. Absolutely. And one other thing I really want to talk to you about, which I think is really um, powerful, is that of meditation. Because you you love meditation as I do and Chris does as well. We're, we're all big into the meditation. What, yes. you know, I reckon it would be great to have a business where we could just say, okay, it's meditation time. <laughs> we're all going to go in because after a meditation session, you you have so much insight and you get so many downloads and at least I know I do once you tapped into that intuition that's when you start to get get a lot of the of the um productivity and um, so what impact do you think that meditation has on your own mindset your own well-being and how can we bring that into the environment of the corporate or the business environment yeah well what's really cool is you know I follow Michael Beckwith, who's at Agape Spiritual Center. Mm -hmm. He always talks about how, you know, 30 years ago, you were like so woo-woo if you even said the word meditation. And now I remember I was in a, we were, I was traveling in a, like a suburban with a bunch of executives and I had my phone and my little meditation came on and I kind of turned red and I put it away. And then like three or four different people are like, oh, I also meditated this morning. (laughs) And I was like, oh, apparently now it's like, I should not have to hide it. I have to like say, oh my gosh, I meditated too. But I think what's missing in that is that when it gets, you know, to that point of it's not just meditating for five minutes in the morning, even though that's wonderful. And I recommend people do that. But for me, it's become a process of having really, you know, disciplined practice like Michael Beck that talks about. We've all agreed that we should brush our teeth and brush our hair. Yeah, we're going to yeah. go out in the world completely in our fear-based mind to just out of our heads. But um So yes, you have a meditation practice, but what I have found is that to my point about mindful leadership is that you're actually, I'm in a meditative state like all day. Yeah. So I start with the sitting meditation, but then it's like, how do you train your mind and train yourself to actually be in an observant meditative state state all day so that when the stuff's coming at you as a leader, you can just see it and be like, okay, that's the, the, when they were five. Okay. That's because they're worried about this. Oh, that that's my issue. Okay. You're just watching all of it happen. And then you're like, let me ask a really good question right now and see if I can change the whole entire room environment, you know? So it's, for me, meditation is literally everything. And what I did is I committed to every day for 30 minutes in the morning and the night for one year. Yes. Right. And then it became like flossing or brushing your teeth. And then I started doing an hour and an hour for another year. And then after doing it for that long, that much time, that long, like an hour for a Mm -hmm. year, then I started just doing like 10, 20 minutes in the morning. Yeah. And it, like I said, it becomes a you, you because then it teeth. becomes a daily like like you said. Then you meditate throughout the day. day, and yeah. and I think that like with me and where intuition and meditation have kind of linked up with me is that I use my intuition to guide my entire day. So yeah. my my higher self will say, yes. okay, I ask it first thing in the morning. What am I going to be doing today? And then I'll get the answer. Okay, this, 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 this. Some days it'll be like, okay, you're going to go and work on this project. Other days it's like you're going to go meditate for three hours because that's where I needed to be. And because I had a lot of messages that I had to get to me. And so it's really important that we tap into that intuition and not be frightened to take the time out. Um, Because, you know, if people say, I don't have time to meditate, then you really need to meditate (laughs) because you don't have the, um because you're you're in that whole mindset of um go 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 if you're not taking the time to just take out you know even 20 minutes or 10 minutes yeah. even yeah. to start off with then you really need to because it yeah. it means that you're not starting you're not starting the day on on a good night i mean chris meditates first thing in the morning as i do and i think it becomes a way of life so how yes. can we if we're looking at our teams and our leaders yeah. how can we help them to stay in that neutral place like what you were just talking about that you can look at somebody in your team or your family or your friends or whatever it is you can look at them and they're going through their own stuff because you know we all have stuff that we're going through yeah. they're going through their own stuff you don't take that on yourself but you can look at it and you can go okay you know, um, what's going on here and and just stay in that neutral place because I think that we react to different yeah, situations. You know. How can how can we start to do that? Well, one thing that we do at this school that I run is I actually took this from a friend of mine, is that instead of calling it meditation, we call it true north. Yeah. And before every single adult meeting, 
if it's you know staff meeting or whatever, we all spend three minutes being guided through True North because we can't okay. call it meditation because yeah. people get a little offended by that. So we call it True North. So we're like, oh yeah, I'm just going to ground myself and get to my center. And we do that every single day, sometimes multiple times a day. So we embed it in our culture, which I think is really important. And um, and then the law of attraction does play in when yeah. you start to really meditate. And to your point, Jennifer, you know, you found me intuitively when you start to yeah. build your teams and attract your people. Like you, nobody has a problem with doing true north in my school. Not, Not because they're all into spirituality or anything like that. Just because there's something going on. They you know, know that and they notice them. it. And they notice it. And once you start to implement this, you do notice it. And it's just like with, um, as I said to you before our call, I've, I've got a number of different collaborators that I collaborate with. Chris is one of them. And I met Chris through my, my summit that I held uh, the year before last. Nice. And it was all through intuition. And this yeah. is how we connect with people. <laughs> is. This is yeah. how we, we attract people into our lives that are going to resonate with us. Yeah. And I think that once we can start to tap into that and, and I bet, do you, do you have some way with your kids? Do you, do your kids do true North as well at the school? No, they don't. And it's really oh. interesting because my dad grew up as a Buddhist in the sect that Tina Turner did, oh, okay. the SGI, which is like an American Buddhist group. Yeah. And people always ask me like, are you Buddhist? I'm like, no, I don't, I'm not Buddhist. Right. Like <laughs> now, of course I follow all the principles. So this yeah. is my point. Your kid, my kids don't actually talk about it. And they actually have a term where my wife and I are talking. It's called SS which stands for spiritual shit. Yeah. So they really are pretty much not interested. My kids are the same. Of course, worry. they're listening to everything we're saying. And it's all about modeling. And you know, like I was going to say with organizations, you create an environment yeah. where people feel safe and they feel comfortable and there's a culture. And then you'll still see people, you know, actually being calm, being neutral. And they follow, you know, they follow the leader. I always tell this everybody, every time I'm executive coaching, like everything you're doing, whether okay. it's conscious or unconscious, the way you walk, the way you talk, they're all following you. Yeah. Like, so you have to be aware of that. So if you're rude and you're cutting people off and you're, that's going to be your culture, right? And all yeah. of your issues are going to be the culture of the organ, especially if you're the founder. As the founder, I knew that. I was like, all of my issues are going to be all over the place in five yeah. years. So like, I better do some serious work on myself to see if I can minimize the amount of and that's that the, And that's the thing. I think before we can create these these successful businesses we need to work on ourselves and we need to figure out what what inner child wounds we have we need to figure out what our shadow our shadow side is so that we can start to start to build from within and because we do mirror out to us and even though our kids call it ss because mine do the exact same thing um they they see us and they know exactly what we're doing and there will be some of it that will be starting to sort of like go in and they'll see that we're of a different vibration. And um, so even though a lot of that's peer pressure too, a lot of that's like, oh, if I, if I accept this whole woo woo type of let's go meditate type thing, I have a little meditation nook at home and it's kind of like literally a bay window um, that I have a curtain across and I have my beanbag and stuff in there and then I have like candles and, and crystals and all that sort of thing. And the kids have learned from very, very early on, do not come into my meditation nook. Right, if, I'm, <laughs> if I'm meditating, um, because it happened a couple of times and it's like, dude, if I'm meditating, you cannot enter the meditation nook because you're in that vibration. And yeah. so I think, it's, I think it's about, you know, showing them, um, yep. what impact it has but not pushing yep. it on to them because they'll they'll do it in their own time if that's something that's yep. important to them and yep. sometimes people find it very difficult to meditate yeah I know my exactly. mum she the first time she meditated she got so scared because she did a meditation where you know you lose sight of your whole body like you kind of like you know it completely everything just you couldn't feel your legs couldn't feel your arms and it scared her so much she's never done it again and I said, I well, meditation it. doesn't have to be like that. No. So, so what is, what is, and I'm going to get this from both of you guys. What would your definition be of meditation? You want to go ahead, Chris? Like you you go talk. first, Chris. <laughs> I mean, I'll just keep it simple. I'm not going to give the formal. I mean, for me, it's just, it's the ability to be in the present moment. Yeah. You know, detached mm -hmm. from things beyond my control, focused only on what is in the moment, you know, and just yes. letting everything go, but being in my body, being yes. in my, you know, uh, just where I am and yeah. just allowing myself to be. And, yes. you know, and when I can be, 
I opened myself up to more what Dave talked about more clarity and through clarity, I could be more focused so I could be mindful of my communication to myself, how I speak yes. to others. So I'm not speaking from codependency, but interdependency. I'm yes. shifting yeah. away from passive aggressive styles of communication to be more assertive and same with my behavior and my attitude shifts where I, you know, I'm in control of my attitude. I see things happening for me, not to me. Yes. And then my emotions. So if something would trigger something initially, that's a negative emotion. Well, okay. That's, that's what's happening. But I know that my secondary emotion is a choice and I can choose to think in a positive way to respond to the situation. And yeah. take action. So I'm not I'm less caught up in procrastination, distraction, and focused yes. on the priorities that matter. And then as I'm an example of that and resourceful to others, then hopefully others start to do the same over time. Yep. Exactly. Yep. Fantastic. And what about you, David? Well, I would put a yes and to that. I'd say yes. And I always like to tell people that, you know, I was telling you about that inner GPS course. I say, try and find what works best for you. Yeah. All, because of all my childhood trauma, when I first sat down to meditate, I literally thought I was going to die. Yeah. And, you know, one of them was like, put your hand on your heart and I almost passed out. So what I always yeah. tell people is to find your thing. Is it like walking? Is it mm -hmm. painting? Is it singing? Is it listening to music? Like, because sometimes people get stuck on the sitting meditation. Yeah, and, and it doesn't like work for everyone. Exactly. And then they run away from it. So I always say just like, in my course, I, I spend like the first week, just practice all these different ways. Yeah. And then do the one you love the most, which is like five or 10 minutes a day. You know, for me, I go, I'm very kinesthetic. So I go for a walk every morning. Yeah. And, yeah. and then when I sit to meditate after the walk, it's like the downloads are just everywhere. But sometimes I just walk and that's meditated, you know? So yeah. I really just encourage people to find what works best for them. Well, like, well, like you, uh, meditation, I think, is something that you have to implement daily. It's something that you implement where it's it's throughout the day. If I'm doing the dishes, I'm yes. meditating. Yes. Absolutely. And it's finding a way to be able to enjoy every task that you're doing, no matter what it is, and yeah. be able to tap into that, into that, those downloads as you're doing it. And so I can make, yeah, you know, hanging washing or doing dishes or <laughs> these tasks that are so mundane, I can turn into like this meditation session. And yes. what's really great about meditation is that once you get into that place of, of being consciously aware, as Chris said, of the present yes. and not worried about the future, not worried about the past, we're right here, right now. How are we feeling? What's our body feeling like right now? Um, we can we can st start to calm our mind. We can stop that thinking process, and we can actually look at somebody. We could look at when you're in that state. You can look at a kid that's having a tantrum, and you can look at it from a neutral place and go, "I love you," even still. You know what I mean? It's kind of like that. You don't take it on because you're in the present moment. You know that they've got their own journey. And, and it's the same with your employees. Your employees have their own stuff going on. When you're in the meditative state, it's like throughout the day, as you just said, David, um, then you're able to tap into that intuition, tap into those messages that are coming in yeah. and, and do it from a place of calm and peace. And people respond differently. You know, when yeah. you're, when you're um, if someone's coming towards you and they're in fear, the moment you can go into that neutral space and tap in, yeah. Just by looking at them, you can practice with your children. Yeah. Just by looking at them, they will, the energy will shift. And yeah. I do it with my kids all the time. They're nine and 11 and they're upset. They're angry. They're kind of yelling at me. And I just sit there and I just kind of look at them for a moment. And then all of a sudden the energy shifts and they're hugging me or something. You know, it's yeah. so powerful. It's it is. It is absolutely. Well, this is this has been such a cool conversation. And actually, I was going to say, I would love to have you on my conscious parenting segment as well, um, David. Be, oh, that'd be great. Yeah. To talk about to talk about the the school and and your views on conscious parenting. But in terms of leadership, entrepreneurs, business owners, this has been fantastic. It's really important that us as leaders that we start to really listen to our intuition. We start listening to that inner guidance and start getting those messages that your higher self sending you because you can get some rock solid ideas and you can be put on the path of on the right direction that's going to lead you towards whatever you're desiring. So as we said at the start of the interview, you may be scared, you may be in fear of shifting directions, of pivoting, but it's really important that we do sometimes because sometimes we'll stay in a situation because it's comfortable 
but it's not always the best direction for you. So Amen. wonderful, <laughs> wonderful conversation. Thanks for joining us, Chris. I'm so glad you were able to come in and, and meet David and, and give us your insight as well. And um, No, my pleasure. And I want to thank David for sharing uh, the, the valuable wisdom there that is shared. And I think it's going to help so many people out that are listening absolutely. to this. Absolutely. Absolutely. Great meeting because you, Chris. Yeah. yeah. Good meeting you. <laughs> Okay, that's wonderful. Thank you so much for being here with us. Now, before we do go, let us know what how people can contact you. Let us know about the projects that you have going on, and um, and yeah, and then we'll let you go. Yeah. So um, I have it's really simple, davidkrichards.com, and I did mention this course that I always offer during my podcast interviews, mm -hmm. and it's fifty percent off for anyone who listens on the podcast. So I'll give awesome. you the information. You can yeah. Put that in. Send me the information. I'll put it in the yeah. show notes. And yep. then, yeah, and then go go do the course. Is that the inner guidance course you're talking about? Yeah, or? energy, the inner GPS course. Yeah, inner it's GPS. a self-guided course. And uh, it's really simple to follow. So it's there and it's... And it's definitely, definitely worth doing because once you can tap into that inner guidance, I mean, you know, the world's your oyster, seriously. So thank you so much, David, for being here. All of that information will be in the show notes. And I look forward to catching up with you shortly. Thanks, Chris. Thank you to both, thanks to both of you. Thanks.